Political Liberalism Seminar. My name is Ivan Marinovic. I'm a professor here at Stanford Graduate School of Business. And it's my honor to introduce today Matt Taibbi. He's the author of the New York Times bestsellers Insane Clown President, The Divide, Brieftopia, and The Great Derangement. He's a contribu contributing editor for Rolling Stone and a winner of the 2008 National Magazine Award for his co columns and commentary. His more recent book is I Can't Breathe, A Killing on Bay Street. It's about the infamous killing of Eric Garner by the New York City Police. Recently, he has, investigating, he has investigated the seeming collusion and coordination between government, big tech, and universities to censor viewpoints for which he has testified before Congress. He's here to talk about what he found. So welcome, Matt. Thank you so much for having me on, and, and thank you everybody for for coming out. This is a, a real honor, um, and you know, especially in, in the last year, um, it, it's it's been really interesting. Uh, obviously, uh, it's great to be able to talk to people from Stanford. Um, there's been some enmity in um, in public. Uh, between the Twitter files reporters and and uh, and some of the programs at Stanford, but, but there's also been uh, there have been quite a number of people uh, on campus who were very helpful to us in researching this topic. Sometimes they didn't always agree with what we were doing, but we're we're helpful anyway. Uh, so it's great to be able to to do this presentation, which I'll try to get through quickly so we can have a discussion about it. Um, but uh, basically, um, this is about free speech and digital censorship in America. Um, this is a topic I've been covering for quite some time. And uh, I just wanted to start with a slide uh, that goes back a little bit in time just to show what the attitudes were um, once upon a time. So this is uh, August 1st, 1989. And you might remember uh, a pretty great hip hop album came out um, called Straight Outta Compton by NWA and the FBI or someone in uh, an FBI office sent a letter uh, to Prestige Records, the, the outlet that put out uh, that uh, NWA's work. And basically in sort of a polite tone complained, they said uh, advocating violence and assault is wrong um they sort of wanted to share their thoughts on the matter and if you go to the next slide you'll see uh that this was a national news phenomenon just just the fbi the, the act of the fbi sending a letter uh expressing its opinion about content to a content creator was considered a, a major speech issue especially uh among american liberals you see on the uh on the far left there, uh, the Village Voice. I was actually an intern um, at The Voice roughly around this time, and I sat near a figure named Nat Hentoff, who was sort of the bard of American liberalism back in the day. He had a desk that was stacked uh, far above his head with letters of people who had had, you know, been involved in various speech causes. And this uh, NWA, uh, you know, issue with the FBI sending them a letter was uh, for them a cause celeb for a while. Uh, the New York Times covered it, the Washington Post covered it, the LA Times covered it, everybody covered it. Um, and I wanted to point that out to contrast it with, if you go to the next slide, um, the Twitter files, which was a story that I started working on uh, roughly uh, this week last year. I actually had been covering the topic of digital censorship for years before that, not constantly, but um, but a bit going back to 2018. We'll get to that. But the Twitter files at their essence, and if you go to the next slide, were the same story, except on a much huger scale. And we didn't know that initially, you know, the first the first Twitter files uh, installment which in hindsight, I, I regret a little bit because the choice of topic um, was spun as being partisan. Yeah, it was about the 100, 100 Biden laptop story that was really about the decision within Twitter to block that story. Uh, along with Facebook, those two platforms blocked 
uh, a New York Post expose about Hunter Biden's laptop. And this, I thought, was a historic episode in American censorship. We, had, we hadn't really had a preemptive um, restriction on the, the distribution of a news story like that. There wasn't, ha hadn't even really been an attempt along those lines, um, except informally, uh, in, unless you went all the way back to the Pentagon Papers. So, so this successful blockage, even if for a very short time, I thought was a significant story. And because Mark Zuckerberg at, at Facebook had both testified before Congress and um, given an interview to Joe Rogan, suggesting that he had been guided toward that decision by the FBI, I decided to focus on um, the Hunter Biden laptop story because I thought if there was evidence of government interference, we would find it there. We didn't find it in uh, the Hunter Biden story, not exactly anyway, but once we got into open-ended searches of material within Twitter, we started to see stuff like this. And it began with you know, somewhat confusing emails that where they were full of acronyms, some of which we, we recognized, some of which we didn't, but you see here is FBI referral, Iran election disinfo, and then there's just a list of accounts. Um, and this would be followed by other things like it. If we go to the next screen, then it was just spreadsheets. Uh, you, you would see through you know, there'd be a, a government official, usually from something called the Foreign Influence Task Force, which is technically an FBI body, but um, it incorporates people from the Department of Homeland Security, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and they would be forwarding lists of account names. Uh, then we started to see, if you go to the next one, uh, there would be material that wouldn't even be categorized as, as disinformation exactly. You would see things like the following accounts contain anti-Ukraine narratives. Uh, so the first things that we saw from the FBI were kind of understandable. Like the, the, they actually had one whole field office devoted to looking for tweets from people telling people to vote for pr the presidential election on a Wednesday. And uh, you can kind of understand there's, a, there's an interest in preventing that kind of thing. You want people to be able to go out and vote. It's not a it's not a great exercise of free speech to, to tell people that the, you know, the election is on a Wednesday instead of a Tuesday. Um, but as you go deeper, and this would be a pattern throughout this entire experience, suddenly it broadens into something else. Anti-Ukraine narratives, does that, is that disinformation exactly? Is that incorrect factually? Um, what, are, what exactly are they asking? Then we started to see more. We can move on, uh, Yvonne. Um, Sometimes there would be very elaborate, um, highly produced reports uh, that would sort of recommend that the platforms uh, be on the lookout for things like neo-Nazi, uh, the, the theme of Ukrainians as neo-Nazis. There'd be recommendations about uh, Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, and Burisma. Uh, in a few cases, we were able to determine that these didn't come from the FBI, but came from foreign intelligence services. Um, but if you go on to the next from there, uh, then we started to see this. And this is where things really sort of heated up for us. The, these emails um, were about something called an industry meeting. And initially, what we were seeing were sort of informal communications between uh, agencies like the FBI, the DHS, and platforms like Twitter. Uh, then we started to see, especially in the summer of 2020, there were a series of communications where basically the gist of it was, let's get organized, let's do this in a way that's not ad hoc anymore. Um, we're going to have a regular meeting uh, between uh, FBI, DHS, ODNI, and uh, and multiple companies, not just uh, Twitter, but Twitter, Google, Facebook, Pinterest, Wikimedia, and many others, they would be in the subject line if you opened it, which you can't hear. And then there would be a briefing from a government official about um, all sorts of things you see have highlighted here, uh, OGA briefing, and OGA, uh, as we learned, was 
It's a euphemism for other government agencies, which is a euphemism sometimes for the CIA specifically or intelligence generally. Either way, there was a lot of OGA um, in these meetings. They were originally monthly, then they became weekly. Uh, and this was the beginning of what we discovered was sort of an organized content flagging bureaucracy. Um, you can go on. Uh, the numbers of the of flagged requests started to be so much that you saw things like this. This is an FBI agent uh, apologizing. Um, I apologize in advance for adding to your workload. We're like, basically, we're sending you so much stuff. I'm sorry. Uh, and there was grumbling, uh, some of which we published that was humorous, uh, but Twitter was doing a lot of work uh, for, but wasn't really clear who, who was working for whom in this, in this situation. I'm still not entirely clear about it. Um, it's an interesting question, one that I think needs to be debated a little bit, what exactly is going on here? Uh, but they were sending lots of stuff and they were conscious of how much they were sending. Go on. Um, one of the criticisms that we got early on was that, oh, this is only about right-wing media or right-wing concerns. And we, we obviously didn't have the manpower or the person power to go through every single one of these lists. Um, there were so many, I mean, they were coming on a daily basis and they came in multiple formats and oftentimes they were in sort of spreadsheet form like this. and we couldn't contact every single one, but sometimes we would recognize names. And here, for instance, this is on a list of accounts, um, I believe that were suspected of, of uh, uh, propaganda for pro-Venezuelan propaganda, if I'm not mistaken, I'll have to go back and look. But in any case, the truth out, which is sort of a left-leaning online site, um, they were on this list. And that was one of many, uh, as it turned out, kind of lefty, uh, websites that were mixed in there along with uh, some traditionally conservative sites, actually quite a few traditionally conservative sites, but it's, I just wanted to put that in there just so people understand that it's not just one side or the other. Um, so going on, the industry meeting ended up uh, beginning a, a process by which all the platforms basically sat down and said, we have to have a, a system by which you can send us all of your complaints or your flags, and it has to be formalized so we're not getting it from all directions. As it turned out, this didn't really help Twitter. See, the, the Twitter executives were very upset because it, it, turned, it started to happen that too many uh, officials from too many different government agencies got the phone numbers of like the people in the trust and safety department uh, at Twitter. And they were getting calls all day long to, you should look at this, you should look at that. They wanted to centralize it. Uh, so they did settle on a system eventually where everything would come through, everything that came from the federal government would, would, would be sent through the FBI, through this uh, portal called Teleporter, and this was uh, unfortunate for us because most of the material in Teleporter uh, was on a timer. So we could see that there, there had been something there, but um, we weren't able to retrieve most of, most of the complaints, but we knew they were, they were coming. Um, but that system didn't work. And if you go into the next one, uh, you'll see um, that in addition to the teleporter material, they were still getting emails from all over the place from multiple different agencies on the left there where that it looks like just a list in, in type. Um, that came from a foreign intelligence service through the, the FITF, the foreign intelligence, uh, the, the FBI's foreign influence task force. Um, then they're, they're, they continued to sell, send Excel spreadsheets full of names. And then sometimes there would just be lists of names and they would often not even have an elaborate explanation for what the why they were there. Uh, going on to the next one, we thought this was interesting. Um, here's the, an FBI agent after the election in 2021, uh, basically saying, hey, you're going to start getting stuff from the FBI and the USIC, 
in the intelligence community regarding the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. And um, again, when we when we started to actually get some of those flags, some of it was this, was what you would classify as disinformation, and some of it was just sort of anti-U.S. And we'll get to that in a moment. But moving on, now this was a key email. This um, was a letter from an FBI agent to Yoel Roth, who was the head of um, trust and safety at Twitter. If you read it, basically it's a deal. It's saying the FBI um, is going to handle everything from the federal side. We can give you everything from the FBI uh, and U.S. intelligence uh, agencies. CISA, which is the DHS, that's Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, um, will we'll know what's going on in each state. And so they had this two-tiered uh, information flow. Federal stuff came from uh, through the FBI. The state stuff, which came through this convoluted system called, uh, it, during the elections, it came through something called uh, the Election Integrity Partnership, which we'll get to. Um, but this went down to the level of uh, local police forces in uh, you know midwestern states like uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. They would be funneled up to a state level. The state official would send it to DHS. DHS would send it to send it to Twitter, and it would be handled relatively quickly. Um, so this this email was key because it it outlined. Uh, basically the entire system for us uh, going forward. Um, all right, this I just wanted to share this because this is how um, how sparse the information sometimes was. They would sometimes in great detail tell you why they were sending you accounts. And then other in other cases, there would be just one single paragraph that would say something like the attached email accounts were possibly used for influence operations, social media collection, or social engineering. So it, it really depended on who who at Twitter got these letters. But sometimes they would look all the way into it, and sometimes they um, sometimes they would not do their own investigation. So we, we found both instances. Sometimes Twitter would say no, and they they wouldn't just willy nilly remove the account. Sometimes they would, but uh, the the lack of of uh, explication we thought was I thought was very interesting um, moving moving on um, this was we thought fascinating um, in, re in relation to the war in Ukraine here's the, um, the Ukrainian Secret Service the SBU uh, sends a letter to the FBI with a list of account names that it wants taken down um, and you can see that I've highlighted a couple of them here. One of them is the Canadian journalist, uh, well-known journalist, a friend of mine, Aaron Mate. Uh, he's on there. The Communist Party of Russia is on there. There's a newspaper that I actually used to write for when I lived in Russia called Komsomolska Pravda. They're on there. Uh, and the Foreign Ministry of the Russian, um, of the Russian Federation is on there. They pass on all these requests to Twitter uh, to take these um, accounts down, this seemed to me a striking thing for the FBI to outsource a request to remove American content to a foreign intelligence agency. Twitter, to its credit, didn't take down Aaron Mate's uh, account. They actually wrote a letter back saying, we kind of can't do that. Um, but they did take down most of the rest of them. And uh, we thought that was in interesting. Um, so moving on, um, well, then we started getting into the question of, well, is it just the FBI doing this? And the answer is no. There was a whole galaxy of agencies. So there were, there were multiple different kinds of these flags that came to Twitter. Some of them would be from an agency like HHS or even um, the CDC, and they would be complaining about something specific to their uh, situation, like the, you know, like the COVID um, uh, pandemic. But there were also additionally government agencies that were uh, 
whose mandate was anti-disinformation specifically. So they were all over the place. They were writing to Twitter about uh, and Twitter and other platforms about all, huge ranges of topics, um, and you know not just confining themselves to uh, whatever their agency's you know ostensible mandate was. The Global Engagement Center, uh, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, but it's technically a State Department entity. We knew nothing about it at the beginning. Here you can see um, they're talking about. Uh, COVID misinformation, they're identifying uh, zero hedge as a problem. Uh, it's a very, it's sort of a popular website. Uh, you know, some people accuse it of purveying conspiracy theories, but they, one of the things zero hedge was doing was promoting the idea that, uh, that COVID came from a lab in, uh, in China, and this was considered misinformation. Uh, and the GEC's complaint, if you actually read through it, is not so much what uh, Zero Hedge wrote, but the fact that so many people reacted to it the wrong way. And, and this is an important concept, this idea of what is the political reaction to it, as opposed to whether it's factually true or not. Um, so moving, moving on, um, in another instance that I thought was amazing, uh, the, the GEC, which is nicknamed GEC, uh, <clears throat> they sent a list of 5,500 names, just a gigantic, another one of these gigantic spreadsheets to um, to Twitter. And they were, it was, ostensibly, it was Chinese disinformation about the pandemic. And you can see that they, um, unlike some of the other agencies, the, the FBI didn't do this as much, for instance. The GEC was trying to get its foot in the door with Twitter and other platforms. And to do that, they were they were trying to exercise some leverage. So what they would do is they would send their lists of names to popular media outlets at the same time that they were sending them to Twitter. And so these stories about people and accounts that had to be taken down that were guilty of uh, misinformation they made headlines in you know, uh, every place from Al Jazeera to, to, to Breitbart, to the New York Times, to other places. And um, many of these accounts turned out to be not even Chinese. There were, there were CNN accounts. Some of them were Chinese uh, sort of embassy officials, uh, but there were, there were multiple Canadian accounts uh, on this list. There was a huge brouhaha behind the scenes. Ultimately, um, this list was kind of repudiated publicly by the government, but I, I wanted to show this because this is an important factor in, in how all this works. Sometimes it, they don't go straight to the platform. Sometimes these agencies or academic researchers, they will go to the media first as a way to kind of exert pressure on the platforms uh, because otherwise it can be said that they're not taking things down quickly enough. Uh, moving on. Um, the GEC had a, uh, would, would frequently send reports about things they called information ecosystems. And um, this, the, the concept here is, is if, you know, a politician is too in line with, say, Russia or Iran or China or some other, you know, foreign um, country that uh, isn't, is considered not aligned with our interests. They would say that you know this politician was part of that ecosystem. So it's sort of a guilt by association situation. Um, and they sent a list of accounts. And, and if you read closely, you'll see that it says, yeah, some of them are um, pushing COVID misinformation and other things, but some of them are also just they're 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 they are attacking Italian politicians, the EU, and the United States. And uh, people on the list included uh, people, politicians like Giuseppe Conte, who was a, um, a, he's a figure in Italy. He's not exactly equivalent to Bernie Sanders, but he's roughly that kind of uh, person. They had other um, Italian de uh, Democrats uh, on this list. 
but they they frequently use this tactic of of saying somebody was in the information ecosystem of you know a, a certain foreign power um going going on all right now we get to stanford um probably don't need to go into to this all that much uh but the election integrity partnership was one of the outsource mechanisms uh, through which um the government was uh, working in a, sort of hand in glove with sometimes yeah. academic outlets sometimes civil society organizations the eip basically became like a clearinghouse for election misinformation disinformation and um you can see here that they're saying that they got 600 they, they processed 639 in scope tickets these are what they call JIRA tickets of, about um, individual websites. I know because from the, one of the people who testified sort of behind closed doors to Congress about this, not testified, I guess gave a deposition, that <clears throat> each one of those tickets could refer to thousands of accounts. And you'll see in their final report, they boast that 35% of the URLs, Michael Schellenberger talked about this last week, um, that they shared with the various platforms were either labeled, removed, or soft blocked. This was back when uh, they were promoting that as a positive. Um, you know, we're, we're effective 35% of the time and getting getting things actioned. Uh, if you go on, so one of the main issues with the EIP is: is it a government program? Is it not a government program? Um, in the Twitter files. We had already seen emails to the effect that before EIP was established, that uh, DHS was looking to establish a centralized border portal for reporting election uh, information. Um, recently, the House Weaponization of Government Committee released an email that they found, you know, after subpoena issuing a subpoena to the SIO, um, <clears throat> that, that contained an email from the Atlantic Council basically saying that EIP was set up at the request of the Department of Homeland um, Security. You know, I, I never thought that this distinction was all that meaningful, but because they already officially listed in their literature, CISA and GEC as basically partners um, in this enterprise. So whether it was initiated by CISA or DHS or whether that happened along the line. It looks like it was initiated, however, uh, by DHS. It was a government partnered organization. And we can go on. This is just to an indication about how they sometimes give varying answers about the First Amendment. Um, I saw that in some of the, these uh, um, depositions behind the scenes, there was a, an EIP official who said we weren't concerned about infringing on the First Amendment because we're not a government actor. But then when you look at the, the same subpoenaed information that the Weaponization of Government Committee got, um, the research director at, at uh, EIP, Rene Duresta, she has notes in one of her presentations um, to mention the fact that the, the EIP has unclear legal authorities, including very real First Amendment questions. So this is another theme that's constant with this, like sometimes they may say represent one thing publicly and then privately there are concerns. We can go on. So the Virality Project was the successor to EIP. And uh, there's a couple of concepts that are important with the Virality Project. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this whole anti-disinformation era is if you, if you go back to the kind of pre-internet age, people like me, journalists like myself, we were always trained that, you know, there are very serious restrictions on speech and journalism. You got to deal with libel and defamation and all kinds of other um, issues. And, <clears throat> but the system punishes the speech, not, not the speaker. So if I lose a libel case, it's not like I get thrown out of media. I mean, it might be career crushing, depending on how bad uh, the offense was. And sometimes journalists deserve that. Sometimes, however, it's 
more in the realm of an honest mistake that actually did damage to somebody and you got to pay you got to re remunerate the victim and move on the whole point is though that the system was designed to try to encourage reporters and other pe purveyors of content to do better right like in, in other words if you get punished um, if you get caught doing something wrong it's not like you have a scarlet letter on you forever and you're and you're removed from the speech landscape you have to pay the piper and and learn your lesson and you know get back on the saddle this system very specifically does not do that and if you see the little um in uh, notation below there this is one of the first letters um that was sort of sent internally to the multiple platforms that were involved in the virality project they talk about repeat offenders and they mention robert f kennedy jr and they, they they mention the fact that content by people like this is almost is quote unquote almost always reportable so they're focused on the person not what that person is saying and this also shows up in sort of some of the algorithmic calculations that go into speech suppression they they would uh the person would accumulate demerits as opposed to uh the speech we can go on the virality project was also um a place where we got to see very clearly the concept of malinformation the <clears throat> department of homeland security CISA, has this has something called the mdm subcommittee that's malinformation disinformation i'm sorry misinformation disinformation malinformation malinformation is information that is true but produces the wrong uh, political outcome. So you see here, they're tracking things like um, news stories about, about breakthrough infections, cases of people having vaccine injury, um, and people talking about natural immunity, not because any of these things were factually incorrect, but because they might've promoted hesitancy. They might've, um, you know, inspired people to not get the vaccine. So again, totally opposite to the old journalism model, which is, if it's true, it, it's fine. We put it out there and then it's sort of up to the public to deal with it. They're thinking ahead. They're thinking we have to imagine how people are gonna to respond to this politically and, and deal with it on, on that level. Um, next one. And this brings us to Stanford's own Jay Bhattacharya. If Jay's here tonight, um, uh, here today, Jay, hello Jay. Uh, he's a beautiful person. The thing on the far right there, that little screenshot, that's one of the very first things that we saw in the Twitter files. That uh, Barry Weiss and I were sitting in front of a terminal, and we saw that little notation that says "trends blacklist." Um, <clears throat> that's how we knew that uh, Jay's um, speech was being deamplified on Twitter. Uh, there's also an example here from um, Martin Kaldorf. You can see the letter um, that came out of another investigation in, <clears throat> involving Francis Collins saying that uh, the um, the Great Barrington Declaration needs to have be, uh, there needs to be a, um, you know, a quick and devastating takedown of its premise. So we don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly what the in between story is there, but we do know that the end story with Jay is that and, and people like him is that they were suppressed, even though they weren't factually incorrect. In fact, there isn't even a, an assertion of disinformation. So to go on. Same thing. Um, this is from the Missouri v. Biden lawsuit, uh, which is in which uh, Dr. Bhattacharya is a, a plaintiff. This is a letter from Facebook to um, uh, a WHO official talking about how the stuff that basically you're asking us to take down, this is often true content. Um, and this is very similar to what was going on at the VP, but I just wanted to show that it's across multiple platforms. Uh, keep going. Good. Which brings us to the CTI League. This is the stuff that we just started, Michael Schellenberger and I just started putting out last week. A whistleblower uh, came forward with <clears throat> documents about um, a group that was ostensibly volunteer. It was founded by a British data scientist named Sarah Jane Turp. And um, 
a, an official often called a technologist for Special Operations Command. He was a Navy commander at the time as well. The CTI League or CTIL, the, this was ostensibly uh, about identifying COVID misinformation and, and sending that uh, information to uh, the platforms. A couple of notes here. One, you can see in the sort of in the bottom um, right hand corner, that's uh, Brian Krebs, I'm sorry, uh, Chris Krebs of the uh, of the CISA, the head of CISA sort of announcing that they're part partnering with the CTI League. And then the other interesting thing about CTIL is just that there's a lot of stuff about offense, not just about censorship or deamplification, but about doing things like creating sock puppet accounts to go onto Twitter uh, um, and Facebook um, to infiltrate uh, groups like the Boogaloo Boys. Uh, it instructed people on using burner e uh, email and, and phone numbers, uh, creating false identities. You can see that there's a, a notation there to, you know, lock your shit down, I think is what it says. So there's all the sort of spy craft involved and we're at the early stages of understanding what that's about, but this is offensive inform information operations as opposed to just defensive. A um, couple of last ones. Uh, one of the early trainings for the CTIL, um, <laughs> this, like the second slide in it is a quote from the Joint Chiefs of Staff talking about how countermeasures are a form of military science that's designed to impair the op operational effectiveness of enemy activity they can be passive active or passive and can be deployed preemptively or reactively and two points about this one these are people who are going to be reviewing the speech of other americans and they're talking about uh, impairing the effectiveness of the enemy so that's so military conception. Um, if I had more time, I'd go into the idea that, you know, I, I was told by people who worked in the counterterrorism world that this is part of a switch. This whole world moved from what he called CT to CP, counterterrorism to counterpopulism. You, you see this all across the military bureaucracy. Uh, the other thing is that they're here, they're talking about preemptive action. This is a very big theme with CTI League, and we're starting to see in other places too what they call left of boom operations, pre-bunking, trying to do something before the bad speech gets to be aired on, uh, on platforms. Um, and so that's not just merely reacting, that's uh, acting preemptively. And then just a few more, uh, CTIL quickly went after left and right. You see there's anti-lockdown protests they were monitoring on one side. I know it's very hard to read, but if you actually look at that fuzzy little uh, thing there, you'll see that they, they were monitoring hashtags like healthcare for all. Um, there were pro-Palestinian groups in there. Um, again, common misconception that it's just the right. It's also the left. It's more the right, but it's also the left. Uh, and then just a couple more. The head of, um, of uh, CTIL, Sarah Jane Terp, she was giving a training. She talked about how the real one-on-one -on -one here is happy or sad. A lot of these folks um, came from the corporate marketing world. They were, um, in addition to the military training that some of these people had, they, they were also experts in brand management. So they were looking at content in terms of, does this reflect poorly um, or well on our product? And let's apply that to things like nation states too. Is this pro or anti-US? Is this pro or anti-US policy? And that's how they, was, they started to define um, disinformation. And then <clears throat> I think this is the last one. Um, this comes from a, um, a FOIA request that I got back recently where one of the, pri one of the members of the CISA MDM subcommittee, also a researcher at the University of Washington, Kate Starbird. There's a letter from her, <clears throat> but they talk about um, creating programs that would empower individuals to be resilient against despair-inducing MDM. So here you have 
you, you go from misinformation to despair inducing MDM, which could be malinformation, again, could be true activity. And that's, that's kind of the same happy, sad distinction. Like they are, are we going after this material because it makes people sad about current policy or their situation. We also saw stuff about what they call financial MD. So that could be, hey, there's nervousness about this bank. Do we need to step in and prevent people from spreading rumors? So maybe they'll to stop a run to the exits. Think about the applications of that. Um, you know, they the, the could be very wide ranging. Um, <clears throat> and actually, I'm just going to stop here. I mean, because I, I, I could go on and talk about um, contractors like NewsGuard and Global Disinformation Index, who are also getting uh, funding from the government. But just with these with, with these slides, I just wanted to show sort of the universe of where all of these requests and, and all of this anti disinformation activity is coming from. You have the Department of Defense is involved in some of this. You have you know agencies like DHS, FBI, the Department of State. Um, nearly all of them are specifically legally barred from being, you know, meddling in the domestic news landscape. And, and yet they are uh, in many different ways, and both formally, informally. Um, so it's, a, it's an extraordinarily ambitious thing. We're only just starting to understand it. Um, you know, how, how far does it extend? How much money is involved in it? when we try to find out the answers to those questions, we find that, for instance, the list of um, contractors for, for the Global Engagement Center are mostly redacted, even in you know, freedom of information requests, we can't find the budgeting, budgeting information. So it's the beginning of a long slog to understanding um, where, how big this thing is and what exactly they're up to. Uh, but to me, as a journalist, it looks like uh, an improper incursion of government um, into the domestic news landscape um, in, in ways that would have been considered absolutely scandalous back, you know, when that NWA story broke. So um, with that, I'd love to take some questions and maybe have a little discussion about some of this. Thank you, man. Uh, great, great presentation. Now we we open the floor for questions, so feel free to raise your hand if you have questions. So the first question by Joshua, Josh Rao. Thanks, Matt. Uh, great presentation and great work. Uh, my, my question for you is, uh, what what trend do you see now in this, um, now that you and your colleagues have exposed some of it, and also uh, Twitter under uh, Musk may be different from Twitter under his leadership, uh, a uh, year or two years ago. So um, w w wondering whether you see the the sort of forces that are doing this now, uh, do you see evidence that they're now uh, on the defensive to some extent? Or or uh, do you think a lot of this stuff is still sort of just proceeding? Do you have reason to believe that a lot of this stuff is still still proceeding apace? That's a great question. Um, we, we have seen some evidence that, for instance, we don't know of, a, of an election integrity partnership uh, project for 2024. We know they did something smaller scale for 2022. We've heard that some of that stuff has been defunded in D in DHS. Um, and but we're also seeing things like the Digital Services Act being passed in Europe. You know, there's a new law that's you know uh, coming down the pipeline in Ireland that's uh, pretty extreme. There there are laws in other countries. The problem with that being that the internet is global. So, you know, if you have content that you have to take down for the EU, it has ramifications for the whole platform. You know, the, the significance of the Elon Musk thing and Elon and I have obviously had our differences, but this system, I don't think that we looked at this kind of sub Rosa system that it doesn't really work if there's somebody dropping out. Uh, it, it's a cartel and it needs everybody um, on board. And I think that's part of why the reaction to him has been uh, you know, so violent. Um, but you know, the, the, we, we've we've seen stories in the news about with quoting some of these people about how it's become so hard to do their work. 
and maybe that's true and maybe that's evidence that uh you know there's been some progress but it also could be that you're just moving this whole thing somewhere else and you know the the other problem is that you know there's a supreme court case maybe coming this missouri v biden even if you get the best ruling in the world on that where's the enforcement mechanism you know how do we know that it would be stopped the stuff i think was already against the law for a lot of these these things um but you know there you would need some kind of agency to go in and 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 root it out and i don't know what what that process would be okay so i'm gonna give priority to new participants so the next is kwang greg john and jonathan uh thanks so much matt uh great talk um i think it's a, a somewhat a related question um so on on this platform uh x now they made a community notes, like a very central feature. Uh, I think in the spirit of what you talked about, they criticized the post and not necessarily the, the person. Do you have any comment on that? Is that something that you're seeing as effective? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I prefer, obviously prefer, there's a couple of things I like about community, uh, the community notes option, as opposed to what they were doing. One is that you can see it, <laughs> you know, um, the huge problem with, what they were doing before and what they're still doing, especially with deamplification, you know, where they're dialing down. I mean, they, it's incredible the tools they have. They can, if they want to dial your traffic down 91 and a half percent, they can do that. Um, you know, you don't know whether what you're saying is unpopular or whether it's being suppressed or, or what. Community notes is, is at least, you can at least see what's going on and it's not punitive in the same way uh obviously there are some problems because sometimes the community notes are incorrect too uh you know i don't know what the solution to this problem is i, I the old school way of litigating everything um you, you couldn't do that without overwhelming the court system so i i don't, I don't know what the solution is exactly but uh I think that's a that's more in the spirit of of, of doing it correctly than what they were doing before Greg, Gregory Kearney. Hey, Matt, I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, I just had a quick question on the actual process by which these things are done. Am I, am I, can you hear me? Yep, I can, yep, absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so I'm curious after three years of, of studying this stuff, whether or not you see any role for security agencies to um, do something about disinformation campaigns and what that process would look like in your ideal scenario. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it's Greg, right? Um, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I, I, I talk to people, if you go back to the 80s, uh, Ronald Reagan created something called the Active Measures Working Group once. And this was designed to respond to Soviet disinformation. You might remember there were stories that America created AIDS. Um, there was another story that was attributed to Soviet news that we were behind the attack on the Pope. Um, and so what do you do about that? Does the government have a role in stopping that? Well, that's an inter it's an interesting question, right? Like I, I would think, um, you know, as a journalist, I certainly don't want the FBI calling up either my distributor or my editor and making recommendations about content. Uh, but what I do, I do think they should be allowed to do, and this is what they used to do, is they used to thoroughly, really, you know, research and debunk uh, a topic if it was, if they were able to do so, publish that, um, and then you know, spread the word to journalists. I don't have any kind of problem with the, with, with government being involved in uh, propagandizing its point of view uh, and even pointing out errors. It's where they go in and make deals to remove things domestically. And the metaphor here isn't even calling your editor. It's basically like calling like the company that that, that has the fleet of trucks that deliver your papers um, or asking Ma Bell to prevent you know phone calls um I, I just don't think they have that role is can can ever be legitimate i have talked to some people who are con military contractors who have found ways that are far less intrusive 
that would be uh, that would limit what they do uh, to st strictly identifying actual foreign uh, bots or for or foreign accounts uh, that are like intelligence related, as opposed to this very broad concept of, you know, you're saying the same things as the Russian foreign ministry, therefore you're, you're misinformation. Uh, if they're going to do it, I, I would at least think that they should be able to do it in a more targeted way. But I, I, that even that makes me very nervous. So, thank you. Thanks, Greg. John, John Cochran. Hi, thank you. This is wonderful. Um, I have uh, two questions. Um, first, um, you mentioned that the, the, there's these, this ecosystem of, of helpers and fellow travelers like our Internet Observatory. Um, but you also mentioned, so the government asks Facebook, you know, take down Matt TV because he's an awful guy. Um, is Facebook just happily yes, sir, going along? Or what are the government's threats? I sense in here that there's a threat. We can unleash an army of regulators on you and close you down tomorrow, which is also extraordinarily illegal. Regulators are supposed to be following procedures, not just, you know, call up the alphabet soup and see who we can use to shut down uh, Facebook tomorrow. But I'm, I'm curious what you have found uh, as far as the explicit or implicit threats that, that gets cooperation from, at least sometimes they must not want to do it. Um, and second, the more, the counter-populism, well, you just said that our entire national security establishment had gone from counter-terrorism to counter-populism, which, and, and I know what counter-populism means, and his name starts with a T, and I'm just uh, astounded <laughs> uh, to hear that. It's new to me, so the more you want to tell us about that, that would be, be better. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so as to the first question, the threat element is a huge part of the Missouri v. Biden case. Uh, I, I heard this argued um, at an appellate hearing for that case in New Orleans. There are instances where um, spokespeople for the Biden administration will talk about uh, things that are happening on Twitter in one breath, and then they will say two sentences later that maybe it's time to revisit Section 230. Uh, and, you know, so that as close as you can come to making an overt threat, I mean, we I, I, I watched two federal judges compare that to the mafia saying, nice story you have there, uh, be a shame if something happened to it. Uh, so, yes, there's that. Uh, in 2017, when a, when a bunch of these companies were called to the Hill to testify about, uh, you know, where there was a demand, you have to come up with a plan to prevent the sowing of discord. Uh, that came simultaneously with like a white paper that was being issued by some of the people in that committee, including uh, Senator, Senator Mark Warner, with a long list of proposed regulations uh, and tax changes for these companies. And we even saw in the Twitter files, one of the Twitter files threads is sort of about this, where they're talking about, um, we're being pressured to come up with stuff proving the existence of Russian bots. And they're doing things, they're contemplating legislation that would impact our ad revenue. And we, we saw that in one email, right? So absolutely, the thread is it's very, very clear, and it's a, it's a big part of this case. And the, the, so far, I've seen judges be very persuaded by that. Uh, the answer that I saw the government lawyer give to that question was just they're not doing it in the same sentence, basically. Um, so, yeah, I don't know about that. Um, and sorry, what was the other question again? Oh, just, you're, you're saying that the entire intelligence apparatus has gone from counterterrorism to counterpopulism, i.e. domestic politics. That just shocked me. I hadn't heard of that before. Yeah, so CT to CP, that, you know, this was something like we didn't understand uh, why all of a sudden these anti-disinformation groups were appearing in 2015, 2016. And I talked to somebody who used to work for GEC, uh, had been in the military. You know, you know, GEC used to be a thing called CSCC. Its explicit mandate was Al Qaeda and, um, and ISIS. They spent all their time in doing Arab language stuff, creating phony Arab language accounts. And then the first head of uh, GEC, when they, when they shut down CSCC, they morphed into GEC, 
the first head was this guy Rick Stengel, and um, actually Yvonne, there's a slide down there for with this information wars, uh, if you want to share it. But but um, is that? Oh, it's in red farther down, I think. Uh, uh, just this in there. Uh, Next, let me know when you want me to. Next, I think two two more. Sorry. More. Yep. Okay. So Stengel, in his he wrote a book about this, and he talks about how see this the information battles we've been fighting far away had come home. Then he talks about how Trump and Brexit are uh, influencing his thinking. He starts lumping ISIS, Putin, and Trump together. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is kind of a common thing. And, and the other aspect of it that, you know, I heard from multiple people who, so we started to get calls from people in the military who were upset that this stuff was being deployed at home. First of all, they don't, a lot of these folks don't have a lot of um, confidence in the, in the uh, expertise and competence of the new people manning these, these positions, but uh, other you know, other folks, you know, think, hey, we developed these really hardcore tools to go after sort of mass murdering terrorists. And now they're, they're going to let loose some of this stuff at home. Like, I, I, this is crazy. And so what we saw, we, we started to hear from those folks. One of the things we heard was when the money started drying up for the counterterrorism mission, the people who were heading a lot of these groups and there's like one in every corner of the national security universe uh, started to articulate this new cause. And after Arab Spring, after Occupy, um, Tea Party, uh, then it's Brexit, then it's uh, Trump, then it's Corbyn, the Bernie Sanders movement. They just, you know, they see these things, they're, they're classifying these things as kind of threat disturbances in kind of the same way and I think it's really creepy and it shows a total like you know confusion about the difference between a, a, a an electoral movement and a and you know a real national security threat okay next is Beric okay um, uh, Matt thank you for a great talk Mark here's my question <clears throat> I mean the the stuff uh uh span two administrations from vastly different perspectives. So it's hard for me to see this as some kind of centralized thing. It seems like very decentralized. And if it's decentralized, how is it happening? Is this just individuals who are taking on for the good and, and using and using the their government roles in uh, in in an, in uh, inappropriate ways? What's what do you think is going on? Well, that's a good question. You know, you you, you do have to wonder, you know, how how do you square this with the fact that Trump was president? You know, I, I think the only thing you can say is maybe he didn't un understand what was going on um, with these programs all that well. If you look, there's been a long developing kind of NGO presence about this. The, you know, groups like the Aspen Institute um, have been, you know, producing papers about uh, disinformation for quite some time. And there's a whole community of academics around the world who've been working on this, and it's resulted in draft legislation that's actually been passed, like the Digital Services Act, which is, you know, it's basically a formalized version of what we, we were looking at under the hood mm -hmm. at Twitter. Um, and, you know, there are other laws in places like Australia that got passed, uh, or at least rules with, with, the, with the institution, of, uh, with the arrival of COVID. I think, you know... I think they have been doing this in an organized way, for, in a, in a semi-organized way. And I say that because it's it, what, what we saw in the Twitter files almost looked like it was a competitive thing where different groups were competing to be the clearinghouse for this stuff. So, so Gek wanted to be more listened to than, than the FBI. Uh, Twitter had a preference for the FBI and, and that irritated the State Department. Um, we've seen DOD, you know, and DHS, they, they had more of a hand in EIP and VP and, 
and the CTI League. Uh, you know, it's sort of like a, a, a rush for contracting dollars, I think. I mean, I, this isn't, I'm only just beginning to learn about this and we have limited visibility into everything. And I, you know, it's not like a Bilderberg thing, I don't think, where there's just a bunch of people in a room um, captaining it. But it does seem like this has been a direction that a lot of these groups have been going but, in for a long time. But who is they? Well, just, you know, for instance, the military has... The, the Pentagon probably has a dozen different anti disinformation uh, or counter disinformation operations going at once. Um, the, in, the, in the UK, you had everything from the intelligence based anti disinformation groups like the Integrity Initiative to there's the, they have a uniformed military uh, group called the 77th Information Brigade uh, in, in Britain that um that's been around for quite some time actually dating back to the early 2010s if i'm not mistaken uh, but specifically like domestic counter disinformation uh i think is is a thing that started to appear in the american context mainly in 2015 2016 that's when GEC was uh founded uh, dhs creates CISA. They, 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 they define cognitive in infrastructure as something that they uh, feel is a, you know, critical infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how, how it all works. I, th I think some of these agencies just drifted in that direction because ideologically they believe that these things are, are really threats. In some cases it's contracting, in some cases there are true believers. And so, you know, um, I think that's an important question. I don't know the answer to it yet. So next is Anoop, Cole, and Kevin. Hi, Matt. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, you've been doing great work, and I've been following it for a while, so keep it up. Um, I have a question about remedies, which you uh, talked about. So, you know, obviously, Missouri v. Biden, uh, and that might lead to injunctive relief. Uh, and uh, maybe there could be some damages, but there are not a lot of cases that I know of on this. And I wanted to figure out if you know if you could talk to us a little bit about what other efforts there are, and then and then more importantly, I think knowing about the sorts of people that are uh, you know standing up for a lot of these or standing up to 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 tackle some of these problems that you're talking about. Uh, are there a lot of lawyers or, or groups willing to take on these cases? Um, uh, is there an internal constituency for more traditional view of the First Amendment within government uh, that you're hearing from, in addition to whistleblowers, actual maybe lawyers or administrators? Um, I'm I'm at a law, law school, at a, at a reasonably good one, I think. Uh, and at the University of Chicago, there's not a lot of uh, appetite among First Amendment scholars, I think, to take on this question, which seems a first order question. I haven't heard about it. Uh, at other schools too, but I imagine you have. So it'd be great to hear a little bit about um, who's joining uh, uh, the fight. That's a great question. I'm sorry, what was your name again, Kevin? Anoop, Anu oh, Anoop Malani. I'm sorry. Um, no so, yeah, uh, well, institutionally in, in government, you know, it's been a huge disappointment to me. I, I used to know, talk pretty regularly with people like Dennis Kucinich, like the, the, the traditional sort of left-leaning civil libertarian caucus that used to have in, in the Democratic side is kind of gone. There, there's nobody there. Like Rohana, I think is sy sympathetic on these issues, but doesn't really make it a priority to talk about them. The committee that I've testified before twice uh, is intensely investigating this stuff. So um, are a couple of other Republican committees. Um, there are a few senators who really care about it. Um, after that, institutionally, there are groups like FIRE, uh, which, you know, is taking up some of this, the New Civil Liberties Alliance, that there's some, which is just importantly, there's some money there that's coming in for, for lawsuits. Um, it, the old ACLU, there are a few of these folks like Nadine Strassen, who ran the ACLU for years, has been very outspoken about this, but there's not a lot of institutional oomph behind taking this on. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a good question. And the, the real disappointment to me, though, however, has been 
the news media. <laughs> I mean, this is this is the the biggest direct threat is to us, and it, it, there's almost no support whatsoever within the business for even addressing this this issue. Um, maybe that will change now because of the Gaza issue. Uh, you know, you, we we've seen that there's some people who are upset about you know that uh, the suppression of that speech. But uh, beyond that, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's not really usually my specialty to, to figure out what the answer is, but um, I mean, I'm curious to know what you think. I mean, legally, I, I, I've actually sat down with people who, who are First Amendment lawyers and talked to them, and they either have never heard of this issue because they, they only read the New York Times and watch MSNBC, or... Um, you know, they think it's appropriate or, you know, they, they think that uh, we need to do something about, uh, you know, there is misinformation on the internet and that, that's why it makes it a tough issue. So I don't know, uh, but I do, I do think something has to be done legally, just ma mainly just on the, on the intelligence services and law enforcement front. Like, I just don't think they, they can have a role in media and have that be a good thing. Great. Cole? Kevin and Randy. Hi, Matt. Thanks for uh, your great talk. I've been a, a fan of your writing going back to the epic takedown of Tom Friedman and his rule of holes. One of my favorite things I've probably ever read. So um, thanks for being here. Question I wanted to ask you is somewhat personal. I know that there was an, a, an incident involving the IRS uh, that came perhaps in response to some of your reporting for the, the Twitter files. Could you tell us about, about that and, and how it it was resolved if it has been? Yeah, uh, so first of all, thanks for the question. Um, uh, when I was testifying before the committee, the weaponization of government committee the first time when I got home that night, uh, <laughs> my wife uh, brought me a note uh, that had been left in the door by the IRS telling me to call in four days. Apparently that's, a, I actually have a relative who's in, who works for the treasury. So this is how I know this, it's a tactic to, to let you freak out over the weekend um, about what that might be. So they don't answer your call if you call before then. Uh, I called, they, they told me about an issue that seemed very odd to me. Um, it was basically that one of my, re or actually two of my returns have been rejected due to uh, identity theft concerns. Um, I didn't know any money, uh, but I told the committee, but I didn't think it could possibly have anything to do with any of my reporting. I thought that was way too weird and conspiratorial. But the the committee ran with it and they sent a letter to the IRS asking for information. And then we got information back showing that the new case had, that had been opened on me on December 24th, 2022, or 2022, which was Christmas Eve and a Saturday and the day that I think the scare, the, the Twitter file story that made me the most nervous came out. Um, uh, and that was the first time I thought, well, it, maybe it is connected. Anyway, it led to um, a discussion between the Judiciary Committee and uh, the, uh, the Treasury Department, and they promised to stop doing home visits or at least curtail them se severely. Uh, there were some other incidents that were maybe less politically um, motivated, but seemed kind of abusive, and uh, that helped led to a policy change. Which I, you know, I'd, I've never seen a politician actually do something for me in my life, so that was really interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it still could be a coincidence, but it's awfully weird. I think. Thank you. Hear me? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Really great stuff. You know, um, I was it, very timely because I was going to ask you about the the mainstream, you know, media places. But but I was going to start with just the observation that, you know, back when McLuhan saw the Internet coming, he said the curators of our information have a lot of power over us and the Internet is going to create a global village where they lose that power. They're going to hate it. And then he actually said, like, you know, 50 years ago, they're going to organize inattention so that they can ah. recapture the power to curate our lives. Uh, and, and, and that, like, I mean, he saw this coming a long time ago and, and the organized inattention happens because the internet is like, not just the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Evening News, back then in the AP, 
you know, it's kind of easy to curate. But I kind of wonder, it feels like the the curators in the media, um, that, that they want their power back. That, that, that's my theory. But but the way they've treated you is really just inconsistent with everything you learn at journalism school, at least used to. Uh, and, and so I wonder if you've uncovered a lot of evidence. You, you showed us a little glimpse of it, of like the New York Times or the Washington Post sort of just taking their marching orders, it seems almost like, right? Like they say, say, hey, you need to write a story about Jay Bhattacharya or, or you know, Scott Atlas or something, and then they do. Um, have you looked for a lot of that stuff? Have you found a lot of that stuff? Because I think that's part of it, is that they're kind of part of that team uh, historically, and they don't like the fact that they have to compete with others for attention. So I, I love that question. Um, sadly, I didn't look for it, but found an awful lot of it um and i think you're you're right what what's really weird about this is that the news media company should be should have a built-in animus for the tech companies or at least that they should be representing their own interests because the tech companies basically in one fell swoop swallowed up their whole commercial advantage the newspapers made their money because they had their own distribution networks if you wanted to put an ad out in the in the greater Boston area, you had to go to either the Herald or the Globe because they were the only people who had trucks that could deliver to every door. Well, the internet comes along, they wipe that advantage away, and they start doing much better, more you know, more, more effective advertising. And suddenly, they've got all the money, and they're real billionaires. And the media is like broke, and they're in this hapless position. But you see over and over again in these communications that. You, they're getting marching orders from NGOs, from, you know, FBI agents will tip them off to things. The, the, there was a bogus story uh, that was planted about Russian bots, uh, you know, that were following a Senate uh, Republican candidate uh, named Roy Moore in Alabama. Um, it turned out to be this company called New Knowledge that was doing it. I guess is a political dirty trick, but one part, one element of the story was that they called up a whole bunch of journalists and said, hey, did you notice all those Russian accounts that are following Roy Moore? And we see in the Twitter files all these uh, letters from the Washington Post and other news outlets saying, hey, uh, you know, are you going to, are you going to do something about this? And that's the, that was pretty much the only kind of letter we saw is, you know, how come you haven't taken down this account or that account yet? Um, we just got we just got a report from X person, um, and you know you, you haven't acted yet. Why? And if you know if if they don't comply, there's there's a sort of implied threat that you're going to get a headline the next day. You know, Twitter you know is allowing misinformation and hate on its platform. Uh, the other last thing I'll say about that is one of the really weird things that I noticed is that. The, the marching orders could come in any order. It could start with the FBI, go, uh, go to uh, a research institute, then go to the media, then go to Twitter. It could start, it could start with uh, the, you know, the Anti-Disinformation Institute of Clemson, go to the FBI, then the FBI goes to Twitter, the Twitter goes to the media. Like, it was interchangeable, which is really weird. And, um, you know, the one of the reporters for the guardian sort of describe this as a, a shared endeavor and i think that's kind of what it is it's like groups that should be kind of checking each other's power or should have their own interests they're they're cooperating in this thing in a weird way it's just really creepy wayne rundy hi matt thanks for um the presentation and for the work you do uh, you said the media should have a special interest in what you're doing, and I want to say that academia should also have such a special interest in what you're doing. I think everybody probably in this room can confirm that academia in general has no interest in what you're doing. Um, bringing your name up is, <laughs> uh, is dangerous, and, um, and so I teach science. And of course, the things you brought out about origin of COVID and masking and, and the vaccine and lockdowns and things like that are really important to train students in, uh, in how to make good decisions, how to learn from the past and make a better future. And um, it's not happening. 
And yeah. um, I think you can probably get some support for this opinion. And uh, so I'm asking you, <laughs> please help us in academia to teach two sides. How, how can I do that? Like, what, 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 what's good? <laughs> Well, I'm thankful you're coming to Cornell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I know you went to Bard, and um, by doing that, um, oh, well, uh, you can make that case. Yeah, no, if, if you're at Cornell, I'd look forward to meeting you there. I mean, um, it's frustrating for me because, you know, when I was doing reporting on uh, – the financial services industry, which in a lot of ways is kind of a similar story. It's like this incestuous relationship between government uh, in enforcement and business. Uh, you know, I got, I got tons of invitations to campuses to speak. And, you know, I hear this thing, this uh, issue has been kind of coded as a right wing issue. So even the institutional stuff, the institutional historical stuff that really isn't political um you know nobody wants to hear it which is you know part of the reason that i'm trying to do all these speeches i want to i want to understand that better and and um you know if you if you have any insights to me as to why academics aren't interested in it i i'd be curious to know because i it, it, that's a that's a blind spot for me i don't really understand it i keep asking and it's still a blind spot for me <laughs> All right. Well, well, thanks for the heads up anyway. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. I don't know if there is another question there. I don't see anybody. Any other question? No, I don't think hey, so. Hey, it looks like Jay wanted to. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Hey, Jay. Hey, 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 Matt. Nice to see you. Um, hey, how's it going? Uh, so uh, on this on this question of why academics aren't interested, I think it's really important to know that 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 academics are part of the problem. That in fact, at Stanford where I am, uh, we have this Stanford Internet Observatory that has grants from from the NSF, uh, as, as is linked very closely with CISA, is uh, with with all of these entities, and it's and and, and it's an active participant. Um, the the head of the university was asked in a faculty senate meeting whether uh, whether you know wh wh whether 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 it's in Stanford's interest to like be sponsoring this basically this activist organization that is dr centrally involved in setting the agenda for censorship, um, and he and he told the faculty senate that this was just a research activity. Um, I mean, and, and Stanford has spent millions of dollars trying to protect uh, the uh, the the. The, the this this activity in court because they're getting sued or I think it's at least a million I mean there was a Alex Stamos I think told the the house uh the house committee that uh, that that weaponization could be under oath that that Stanford has spent like six figures or something on this um uh, so I I think that and it's not just Stanford right Harvard's involved uh in this with their with their 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 disinformation center the the um, uh, University of Washington's involved a lot of academic, and there's a whole academic field devoted to this, essentially to censoring censoring regular people online. Um, so it's not it's not just that it's the question is why you're not invited. It's like the, you're you're actively the enemy, Matt. Is the problem right. in, ac in academics? Well, so are you now. So I, well, you know, I know we can <laughs> French figures together. I'm waiting for the IRS to show up in my house. But <laughs> if I could add to that, I mean, Matt did say follow the money about why intelligence yeah. went the way it is. So there's big money. Academics follow the money, but also it will be interesting to see um, if a Republican administration is elected and starts using the same tools against uh, the academics, whether all of a sudden. Uh, they'll have a sudden conversion about free speech and First Amendment and so forth, as as three university presidents seem to have a similar conversion a couple of days ago. Right, right. Yeah, I mean that's that's a good point. But yeah, the the, the, the money is enormous. I mean, the, just the incident recently with Harvard and and Joe and Donovan. If you looked at the the sums involved just in that project, uh, you know they're they're huge, uh, especially for you know, for universities, you know, they're, they're getting a little taste of the military contracting money in some cases. And um, there are private foundations, you know, Pierre Amidiar is funding quite a bit of this stuff. The Newmark Foundation has been pouring money, uh, you know, all over the place. Also, just, you know, we're not that craven. The chance to silence your intellectual and ideological opponents is catnip. To <laughs> 
and they will. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Of course, that's that's what we live for. If I could shut down the Keynesians, I'd be in there immediately. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was God. a joke. But no, it's funny. No, it's there's probably like truth in that, right? I mean, I, 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 that, that's great. Um, you know, it's not funny, but but uh, I think it's important to try to understand what the motivations are. I don't think it's just about money. I mean, I think there's something ideological going on too. But um, but it is it is unfortunate because academia, you know, they stand academics stand as Jay, as you know, academics stand to suffer. I would say even more than journalists do um because you know you can have groundbreaking research as opposed to just some dumb news story being suppressed and and you know, that that is just can't happen you know uh, especially in what we see with groups like cti league or whatever it is it's people have no expertise whatsoever in these topics so sort of censoring people like uj um and i don't understand the logic of that but you know you know that can't happen i don't think so um i would hope that eventually there's a movement against it but that, we, have to, that, we need you to follow through in your case too so so that that's that's important as well that though it seems to me this goes way beyond media and academia you know i am just you know i i i i've been surprised how or i mean it seems like this has just be you know become uh, well, I, 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 I am surprised by how all my left-leaning friends uh, who are not in academia and who are not in the media, who for years styled themselves as civil libertarians and who for years said they cared about censorship, have just no interest at all in this massive, you know, censorship apparatus that the uh, government, together with the universities, together uh, with well, the, 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 together with the tech companies, has built up. Uh, uh, I mean, do you do you find any different, Matt? You know, I know. I mean, it, it's just remarkable how few individuals that I find on the left there are some, but how few actually even think this is an issue. So I've tried every conceivable way to get, I mean, I, I grew up in the left-leaning media, so I, I, you know, I know how people think over there, and I remember the Bush years very vividly, and, and so I've tried every one of the arguments, like, a lot of the groups that do, that sell social media monitoring services, or, or you know, contractors that do uh, anti-disinformation work, they got their starts doing things like selling geolocation data to the Pentagon. And you know, back when that was considered verboten and was was uh, you know deeply controversial on on the left with the you know this idea of selling private information, um, I brought you know I, there are specific examples. The, there's a company called Babel Street that you, that uh, has been doing that, selling that to to um, you know this, to, to the Pentagon. That doesn't work. I tried to point out the class element of it. Uh, which is, you know, really there, there are no working class people involved in this project. Um, I pointed out, tried to point out that there are left leaning political organizations, everything from the yellow vests to, um, you know, especially Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn's the big one. I mean, they, there was a lot of that and, and we need more documentation on that. But it's not just, you know, the, the Trumpists who are, who are getting it, but none of those arguments work and that's again it's kind of a mystery to me why not i i, I don't really get it do you i mean I'd, again I'm, i'd be curious to hear i still think on balance they think that the censorship is working in their favor i i i mean you're, you're right to point out point it out on both sides but i think they might think yeah okay but on net they still think that the system benefits them what do you think of that yeah no sure but i mean i, I mean i grew up you know, with the, you know, the legend of Ira Glasser and Skokie, and mm -hmm. and it was an article of faith among Amer in American liberalism that we must stand up for speech that we ourselves loathe for obvious reasons. Because if we allow that, then the next thing is going to you know the NAACP is not going to be allowed to march. 
this was this wasn't rocket science. I mean, most American liberals understood that implicitly, and that's why they always re, you know reacted so vehemently to you know everything from Robert Maplethorpe to NWA, yeah. right? So yeah. Um, yeah. I, something happened. A switch happened somewhere, and I I just don't I don't really understand. It's, it's a fascinating question. I think. I think that this very intimately tied to social media, it's tied to the fact that that they, when everybody thinks the same way and defines a moral code, that it becomes as if that is the right thing. And so you can then do whatever you want to defend that, even when the, it is just an end justify the means argument. So, you know, it's perfectly okay to shut down anything that talks about what the role the police have in defending us if policemen killed um, George Floyd, right? There's right. no sense. And then we, I'm doing good doing it. You know, one of the big mistakes that people make in all of this is that is that they think if if I'm doing good, it's okay, right? And that the people that are opposed me actually know they're doing bad, which is completely ludicrous. Everybody thinks they're doing good. That's why when, when I ask you the question of where this is coming from, I have to say, I don't think it's coming from a central government thing. I think these are individuals working for these organizations, all under the belief that they're doing good. Yeah, I think I think that's very possible. You know, I, uh, again, I was talking to to somebody, that former GEC person not long ago, who was saying that he thought there were multiple different kinds of people, like there, there were your true believers, there were uh people who are just in it for the money and you know, opportunists um but i think you're you're i think you're right i mean we, we do i certainly think that most of the people that i've encountered since especially since the twitter files they really really believe that they're doing the right thing um i don't think it's just cynical politics with them but uh but you know, I don't know. I mean, I think we have to, We have, it's a reporting task to get to the bottom of where all this started. And that's one of the things I'm working on a book now, trying to figure that out. When when the first time they started looking inward with this stuff was, and I haven't identified that. And, you know, uh, but I think that's a, that's a key story to, to get to. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Great presentation. We are very happy you would join us today. And we hope that in you know in the near future you will join us on campus. We are working to organize a big conference on censorship and surveillance. And so we'll reach out to you soon. Yeah. Hopefully. Wow. Hopefully we get you as a speaker. You and your friends. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, thank you. And thank thank you so much and uh for everybody for turning out. And if um you know, please feel free to reach out to me and, and hopefully um, we can meet in person someday. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you, Matt.